So my name is Rebecca, and I'm going to speak to you today about my PhD research that I've been working on with Dr. Mauro Overend at Cambridge University within the Glass and Facade Technology Research Group. And I've been looking at unlocking some of this reuse potential that Graham and Eva have kindly also spoke about today and addressing some of those end-of-life challenges that we face with present facade systems. So looking at the two systems on the screen, very different, but actually when it comes to end-of-life, they're not so dissimilar. They both involve a highly complex mix of materials that have been processed in several different ways to give them optimal function in use. So weather protection, ensure there's a good seal to ensure that they perform well in use. And everything's sort of in the past 30 years been to try and improve the operational energy of the building so that it can reduce the energy performance during the lifetime. But what we sort of really need to be thinking about is how can we actually then think about how we disassemble these materials to recover them at the end of life. And why this is really important, really, is it's, it's a problem that seems to be getting worse in our facade designs, glass facade designs, sort of advancing new systems that are highly complex, silicon sedent, uh, glazing systems that involve a high mix of adhesives, which, makes it, which at the moment are very difficult to disassemble. Um, and so there's an interesting study by two researchers, Colin Kernan, that looked at the balance between embodied energy and operational energy of buildings. And they found that as we're sort of advancing towards these low energy buildings and near zero energy buildings in practice, the ratio of embodied energy to operational energy is shifting significantly. So embodied energy of the materials that we actually put in is becoming a much more significant factor in the whole life energy of the building. And just to give you a fairly crude evaluation in terms of the cost um, and what we might be losing from the economic point of view, if we take a new facade system, glass facade system at the moment, um, and calculate a glass aluminium ratio of about 60 to 40, we're looking at about 500 pounds per square meter as a new system to install. And so I spoke with a few demolition contractors and asked them, so what do you do at the moment with glass facades at the end of life? And first of all, they weren't necessarily too sure of what I really meant by glass facades, but their main point was that, well, with all the metals in a building, we have a demolition excavator that goes in and pulls out all the important metals, which are considered valuable materials and can be sold on at around about £200 per tonne if they're separated on site effectively. So they're then sold on for recycling. But the glass itself is usually left to shatter to the ground and mixed with other concrete and inert material. And usually used in some sort of aggregate material, road aggregate, um, at a much less value, around about a pound per tonne. So the huge financial loss, really, that we're seeing there, um, that with the right supply chain, could really be, um, we could really take advantage of. So this is really where my research problem sits, in that we're moving towards sort of any more technology advancements in the glass facade, but how can we do this without having that trade-off of uh, the recovery potential of the materials that we design into the systems. So, as Graham and Eva have also spoke about this, uh, this circular economy concept that is becoming much more prevalent in the built environment more recently. Something that has been more sort of well-known and, and products with a smaller lifespan, but something that is very important to consider in the built environment and it's this idea of moving away from the idea of a linear model of taking our materials, producing them, putting them in a system and disposing of them in landfill to some sort of recycling or reuse system that means that we actually retain the materials in that as best high value as possible. So a paper written by Alice Moncaster and Francesco Pomponi at Cambridge University looked at what are the six different pillars that we need to address to realise the circular economy in the built environment? And these fell within behavioural, environmental, technological, economic, governmental and social. And my research is sitting in the first three that I mentioned. And what I speak to you a little bit today is about some of the behavioural barriers that we might see with glass facade reuse. Um, and then speak about the bulk of which is in my paper, the environmental motive and some of the technological barriers. <coughs> So I conducted a survey with around about 40 different stakeholders within the glass facade supply chain, from clients through to main contractors, um, facade contractors and demolition contractors, 
to really gauge the idea of what they think on facade reuse, what does it mean to them? Um, and it was interesting to see that they all have very different opinions on what are the main reasons for any kind of facade replacement in the first place. But the main reasons were usually some, some aesthetic related reason, so wanting to change the building itself to update it and upgrade it, which suggests that maybe that actually it's premature in terms of its performance degradation. But then performance related was also another factor. So it's for some sort of full system reuse. I think in order to enable system reuse, we have to address some sort of testing to enable that the performance can match as new. And aesthetic related suggests that we need some process in place to enable component re reuse and to be able to disassemble the materials to put them and upgrade them into a new system. Um, so some of the main drivers that were mentioned were, of course, cost, which was fairly unsurprising, mainly from demolition contractors that say they wouldn't really want to recover any materials unless there was some sort of incentive for them. Um, but one of the main, main ones is this environmental push that we're seeing. And I think in order to be able to actually quantify that in some way, there needs to be a process to think about glass facade systems in that light. So we bring the question, why do we want to actually reuse these materials? So I took a typical glass facade system. It's a timber aluminium curtain walling system, triple glazed, and looked at four different end-of-life scenarios under a life cycle impact assessment. So this was just specific to the end-of-life stage. So the first scenario was the sort of worst-case scenario of just crushing the building up and all the materials going to mix rubble and to landfill. Second scenario is sort of the typical scenario at the moment, which is some form of selective dismantling. And the materials, the metals being separated on site and the glass being downcycled into some form of aggregate material. The third was the selective dismantle um, for component reuse. So that's assuming there's some sort of disassembly procedure in place to be able to then reuse the, compo the materials and components themselves in a new system. And the fourth scenario was selective dismantle and then a full system reuse, so directly on a new building. So if we could test the uh, performance of the facade in some way, could it then directly be put on a new building for a different project that didn't require that same sort of performance maybe necessarily that was on the original project? So in this, I took uh, the bill of materials for the facade itself that I was looking at. Um, break it down to their different parts, so it's glass, aluminium, timber, and polymers, uh, so EPDM and silicon sealants. Um, I then looked at the relationship between the different elements themselves. So, of course, what's interesting with the glass facade systems that we're talking about is if you're looking at reuse of the system as a whole, it's only going to be, only be able to survive as long as it's nearest adhesively um, connected member. So for example, if we think about full system reuse, we need to think about the service life of the weakest component, which in the glass facade system is usually the laminated glass. But this may change if we're looking at other systems that incorporate more complex components. So photovoltaics, for example, or operable sh shading within the facade system itself. So, as well as looking at these four different end-of-life scenarios, which were assuming that we had full performance of the system or the components, I wanted to take into the service life consideration. So if we were to reuse it 15 years, say, we take the uh, saved carbon emissions as 40% because the service life of the laminated glass is 25 years. So without taking service life into account, you can see the sort of comparison between the embodied energy and the embodied carbon of the different um, end-of-life strategies. And so if we take full system reuse as being the optimal scenario at 100%, we can see with component reuse, we are making considerable savings at around about 83.5% in carbon emissions. But then taking a step down to this common scenario that we have at the moment with recycling, which we think is a good scenario, we're actually only saving around 34% of the maximum potential that we could get. But of course, as I mentioned, I think it's important not to forget some, some form of performance degradation in the system. So, first scenario being if we were to move in 15 years um, with some form of glass separation, we can see that 
the benefits of system reuse are now much less. Um, component reuse still has a good advantage. That's with some form of glass separation for the laminated glass, then be able to reuse the glass panels in a different system. Without glass separation, component reuse drops again, and it's actually edging closer to that recycle scenario that we have at the moment. If we look at um, then at 30 years' lifetime, if we came in to replace the system at 30 years, we see that the system reuse, of course, if you consider that the laminated glass is no longer set acceptable and you can't disassemble the system, then you could consider that there's no savings to be made because it can't actually be comparable with a new performing system. Um, and without some form of glass separation, component reuse, also the benefits are much closer to that of recycling scenario. So it's important to try and think, I think from this, I'm sort of able to evaluate that component reuse really could be the best scenario moving forward to try and reuse our systems. But there's various technical barriers that need to be addressed to actually make that possible. So some of the technical design challenges within glass facade systems, uh, laminated glass, the use of laminated glass, and also the different adhesive sealants that we're using to try and get our facades to perform as best as possible in use. So laminated glass at the moment, um, the automotive industry saw a bit of a wake up to this sort of end of life objective um, back in 2000, and they actually had a policy that was introduced to ensure that there was responsible sourcing and recovery of materials. And they developed a process that involved crushing up the laminated glass and separating out the glass in PVB. So the glass is at about 95% purity and can be reused in glass fibres or bottle glass. But of course, we want to be moving further forward than that and looking at an actual separation process that enables us to reuse the glass as it is. Um, so... Some of the experiments I've been working on in the lab at the moment is looking at trying to develop a process, just a standardised test to be able to characterise the separation of flat glass. So there is some testing, um, and I am aware of some testing that uses heat to separate out the PVB interlayer, but what I want to really do is characterise what, how can we separate it mechanically and what effects heat or moisture or other potentially UV degradation actually has on the interfacial bond to separate the glass and the PVB. And once we're able to characterise those, then can we look to optimise a process that actually enables flat glass separation. Um, so this is a, effectively a compressive shear test where um, there's a force applied to the top side of one glass pane and the bottom side of another and places the interlayer and shear to try and initiate separation along the glass to PVB interface. Um, and just some initial testing that I've been doing in the fairly early stages at the moment, but at room temperature even, we're starting to see the glass fractures in all cases, but we're starting to see some interfacial um, separation between the glass and PVB. Um, so in the middle two pictures there, that's at a 0.5 millimetre per minute strain rate, and we see a clear separation between the interface of the PVB and glass. And once you can actually get into the PVB interlayer itself on the other glass sheet, it's very easy to peel away that interlayer because the bond is very weak in peel. Um, so that alleviates the issue of trying to separate it from the other glass sheet. So I'd like to proceed with these experiments and look at the different effects of strain rates, temperature, um, and moisture, which I know could have a huge effect on weakening that interfacial bond between glass and PVB. Um, and I'm also open to other ideas or discussions on, on how to progress forward with this also. Um, and then the other project that I have a fourth year student working with me on is um, looking at actually debonding existing adhesives. So there's a huge amount of systems, facade systems that are in place at the moment that at some point we might need to disassemble. So we've been looking at debonding the adhesives. Um, what's the best mechanical failure method for actually debonding the adhesives? So she has been looking at comparing um, joints of aluminium to glass in shear and then in cleavage. And we're seeing about a 70% reduction in the failure force required to separate the components. So epoxy there in shear, of course, it's a very strong material, very stiff. In shear, it fractures the substrate. But in cleavage, you actually start to see some cohesive failure and some areas of interfacial failure. 
and then with the silicon as well, we're seeing a different type of failure mode, um, whereby and the failure force is much reduced around about 60 to 70 percent again. So I want to have a look at advancing these methods and perhaps looking at a design that enables some sort of opening mechanism within the adhesive joint to e allow for easy separation of adhesives within facades. Um, so hopefully that sort of brings me, end, me, me to the end. And I'm just looking at an overview of my research at the moment. And really, I, suppose, I think there's two approaches in terms of what we're looking at moving forward for glass facade design. There's the design in existing stock and matching that with the end of life, so actually recovering the material. So we're looking at the debunding of adhesives and separation of laminated glass. Um, but there's also thinking about future design. What can we do differently to make it easier to disassemble these systems? Uh, so different alternative methods of bonding um, and perhaps a new form of IGU, which has been interesting to hear about even in the past couple of days as well, some of the developments there. Um, and the, as I mentioned, this recovery potential comparative assessment that I was looking at, the environmental assessment earlier in, in the presentation, I think it, I want to develop this further and extend it to different systems to try and see how can we actually in that early design stage say, think about the reuse potential of our systems, because it seems like that's not really an additional parameter in design at the moment. So what I just wanted to leave you with really is thinking about what is the future of glass, and perhaps fairly naive into the industry as a whole, being a PhD student, but I think it's interesting going to these events and seeing I was at Glass Tech last year, and it seems like a lot of the designs are sort of going towards complex all-glass facades. One of the quotes from the book was, we should see more transparency through design and minimalism, and the next 30 years will deal with the functionalization of glass. And that, for me, just seems like, okay, we're going to be designing more and more materials and complex systems. So I suppose the challenge that we have to think about is, can we be minimalist by environmental impact, not just aesthetic? And can we be functional, but with the whole life in mind? Um, so yes, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions or suggestions as well for research. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, I, I correct oh. myself now that uh, I, I, I did not read it correctly. It was at the U okay. Cambridge University. <laughs> I was uh, at Manchester before. Um, and so uh, any questions for Rebecca on some of her work? I just, can I just, this one first. Here. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. I would like to ask you if there is any country without glass uh, recycling, how easy is the transportation of it? Have you made any research about it? What's that? Sorry, so... If I'm, in, I'm in Greece. Yeah. I live in Greece. And there is no glass uh, recycling in the region, generally, mm. except St. Gomen, Romania. Mm. So, how is the transportation of uh, recycled glass? Mm. Do you mean crushed glass itself? The crushed glass? or Well, in the UK, for example, I think the transportation of... It's just similar to any of the other uh, rubble from the demolition. So when we say recycling at the moment, it's not really recycling. I think it's important we are aware of that. But we claim we recycle all of our glass from buildings, but in terms of downcycling for aggregate material. And that's fairly easy at the moment to do because it's just a case of loading it all on a transport truck and taking it to the next facility. But um, I think uh, if we're thinking about transport of flat glass, the system, the flat glass itself as a pain, yeah, that's an, another step that we need to consider in the supply chain and actually make plans for, so, yeah. Very important work that, that you are doing. Um, could you say something about the funding of your research and yeah. about other researchers working on the same field? Um, I am uh, asking this especially because since um, in the health and well-being sector, yeah. we are also aware that in, in fact it would be much healthier uh, and less expensive if people would take care of their um, um, gymnastics and their uh, mm. con condition and if they would watch out what they eat. So instead of taking a lot of medication, yeah. We could actually save 
enormously in terms of uh, public funding and so on. But there is hardly any research uh, funding for supporting research that is focused in staying, remaining healthy. Yeah. And there is a lot of research funding for uh, pharmaceutical corporations run by the pharmaceutical corporations. So is it a little bit a similar way that then instead of uh, getting funding or having really a, a vigorous uh, research community to research mm. on how we can save uh, and how we can uh, circulate uh, the materials um, since, let's say, uh, like yesterday, uh, w uh, when there was uh, there was a, a great presentation on Nike's uh, flag uh, flagship store in New York. Mm. As you were also mentioning, there's a um, there's a tendency to uh, to build great uh, uh, great forms, great uh, novel designs, but if we don't have uh, the eagerness of designers and mm. corporations, Nike or Apple or mm or uh, any other one, Tesla, yeah. reusing glass or reusing construction materials, then yeah. we won't have the have anybody to educate the clients and educate yeah. the governments to really push for this research and yeah. work. I th yeah, I think I understand. So, um, so my research is funded by its EPSRC, which is a... Uh, a science council, engineering and physical sciences research council within the EU. Um, and it's, I don't have direct funding from industry, though I have had help from different industry partners and in advice and some samples, for example. And I think um, even since I've started it, it feels like the general mindset is changing. And it feels like people are starting to, rather than sort of shy away from the challenge, actually want to invest in it and be the first to actually do something about it and I think I don't although personally I don't really like the idea of it sustainability is starting to become almost another marketing strategy in itself and sort of being a responsible manufacturer so I do think that um, companies within the industry are starting to think how can I be the first to actually show that I'm making a step to change this does that does that make sense at all but I uh, I do think there's still some resistance there because, as you say, even, for example, a glass manufacturer at the moment, if we start to reuse all of our materials, where is the business model there for them to continue making money? But I think it's sort of changing, changing the business model to be able to do something, changing the services, perhaps. Maybe it's a cleaning and delamination service and then charging for that separately. So it's a, a different business model that needs to be advanced, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, we have uh, probably time for just one quick question. To <laughs> take one from the back here. There seems to be an incredible commercial opportunity to come up with a secondary seal and spacer system that can be um, you know, eas easily demounted, but mm -hmm. has you know, good performance and service. So you can yeah. separate the materials, and um, uh, one yeah. thing that comes to mind is like one of those 3M hooks um, that's temporary, mm. splits off the adhesive when you pull it off the wall, but works fine. Yeah. And I, I hope hope people here make good use of these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, I agree. And yeah, I have seen some interesting work, um, different research ideas, really thinking about more of a mechanical fixing for the ITU, for example. But I'm not too sure how far that's gone into actually assessing the performance to the typical standard system. So I think there's some work to be done there too. Um, yeah, but hopefully I'd like to do that as well. <laughs> great, thank you very much. I, I think there's a great deal of opportunity to really explore this topic. Um, I think. Uh, uh, when we think about the volumes of glass and, and systems that are already out there right now and we think about end of use, uh, what is our role today to be able to impact and uh, implement uh, what I think uh, we, I think at least amongst the three speakers here to, to today so far is uh, what's what, what's that pivot point? Where, where are we going to make that shift and make that change to start thinking about end of life criteria? 
how we're going to manage it, how we're going to take it. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of science that's involved in uh, and research mm. involved in uh, how we're going to manage what we have today and how we're going to deal with it. So we certainly look forward to hearing more uh, from, uh, from the three of you mm. on continued research <laughs> and hopefully uh, come back uh, in two years and uh, share with us some uh, po uh, pro uh, progress in the positive direction. So a mm -hmm. uh, big hand for our, uh, Rebecca as well. And uh, we're going to move on with our program. Hi there. Did you like what you just saw? If you did, why not like the video? Drop us a comment below as well as share the video with others since GPD is all about sharing and to receive more videos in future subscribe and don't forget to click the bell icon for notifications ciao